with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> If I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, July 20th, 2023. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Melissa Via Nicholas, author of Data Borders, How Silicon Valley is Building an Industry Around Immigrants. And later in the show, Kyle Bailey at York University in Toronto, or of there, will be with us to discuss the rise of the far right in Finland. Meanwhile, Trump's legal troubles continue. Jack Smith reportedly seeking charges with a violation of a Reconstruction-era voter fraud statute. Civil rights protections. Interesting. In the hush money case, Trump's plea to move the trial to federal courts rejected. And in the E. Jean Carroll defamation suit, his request for a new trial also rejected. Biden meets privately with the UAW president ahead of a likely auto worker strike contract expires in september marjorie taylor green shows hunter biden revenge porn images in a house hearing rumor did she check the ages for the people watching the house hearing they could be watching on c-span rfk jr testifying today about you know getting banned from twitter whining social media three brave women testified in a texas court yesterday about the personal trauma caused by the abortion ban specific to their experiences meanwhile blue state doctors ramp up efforts to ship abortion pills to red states the appeal reports that children in imprisoned in louisiana's infamous angola prison are being held in their cells for days without AC and 130 degree plus heat. It's Angola prison. Named after Angola, after where slaves came that is on a literally former slave plantation. Yep. There's a lot of disgusting stories. They do like a, essentially like a, a competition for, a, a, we'll yeah. get to that after headlines. Another horrific headline, a 16 year old Guatemalan boy died from an on-the-job accident at a poultry plant in Mississippi. It was illegal for him to be working there. sag confirms it won't halt independent projects with studios like A24. The Republican Alabama legislature passes a redistricting map still in defiance of the Supreme Court order. New York City, City settles with BLM protesters for a historic amount over police brutality. And lastly, Derek Chauvin, George Floyd's killer, asks the Supreme Court to review his conviction. My God. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. Have to acknowledge, of course, that today is the third uh, anniversary of Michael Brooks's passing. Um, Michael would have turned 40 on... Um, august 13th and that is a sunday we're going to be celebrating his life on friday the 11th ahead of that i just um you know when it's not just me hosting we have the whole crew here we figured that his 40th birthday might be a better time to yeah. recognize that but matt you know we I wanted to move it to the birthday uh, thing i think um david griscom will be doing a left reckoning stream uh this afternoon uh, on Michael's passing, yeah, it's it's wild, and 
the uh, Israel Palestine stuff has made had me thinking independently of like, oh, I wonder where Mike would be at because he was already sort of leading the way, I think, yeah, on uh, speaking forthrightly and modeling a way of actually talking about this in um, stark terms that it needs. Uh, and to the point where like his speech his speech to that uh, class on it uh, went viral after his uh, passing. Um, and it's one of the things where I, you know, I, I regularly think of where he would have been on it, but especially during uh, the past week here. Um, but did, uh, yeah. Did I ever tell you that that was at my college too, Lafayette? Oh, no. <laughs> it's like a weird uh, coincidence, I guess. And I remember that because it was like the supermodel Hadid sisters, right? Yeah, that Gigi Hadid, that. I believe. They're Palestinian. Um, and that's... Uh, yeah, it, amazing. He would have like, wh what would his reaction have been to seeing that, all that like attention? Uh, it would attention? have been up there with the Lula um, <laughs> yeah. attention. Like I think honestly, especially just because of like, what the mission was, which was to like uh, get these sorts of things into a broader culture than just like a left culture. Well, when you have <laughs> some of the yeah. um, main uh, supermodels in the world uh, reposting, reposting your comments on Palestine and how you can <laughs> be forthright about it, um, uh, especially as Jews, like I think it's very interesting. It's very, um, that's exactly what he would have wanted. I can still see that clip in my mind with him in front of that chalkboard. I know that classroom too. Um, and that was just, you know, such an epic moment for Michael. And <clears throat> yeah, even the stuff with Lula too, the fact that Lula is out of prison and back in power. I mean, that is just in and of itself a, a, something, you know, he would have loved. But um, yeah, she posted it on, uh, on Instagram as well, which is like even better the than The medium Twitter. for her. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, rest in power as always, um, Michael. And you guys should read uh, Against the Web. You should check out Sam's audiobook version of that. We'll put links to that in the descriptions in the show notes today. Um, and of course, uh, the Michael Brooks show is still as relevant um, as it could be. So check out all that old stuff. Now, um, let's play this clip here of Biden. Biden spoke at the White House recently about the economic gains and some of the numbers that have been coming out about wage growth now we can mitigate and 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 put some cold water on that is in that we've spoken about how rental prices are absolutely out of control and so in some ways the gouging on that end is n making the wage gains not as felt as they should be but the reality is is that for the most part the declining inflation, the increases in uh, wages, unemployment remaining consistently low. These are for standard White House reporters or people that cover politics. Good numbers on that front. We've played clips of Fox News basically saying, well, unemployment could be lower. It's 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 at really low rates right now like we're talking lowest it's been in years if you don't mind looking up the exact year Bradley of that but um this is Biden speaking about some of those dynamics at the White House and talking uh about the Fed's basically aggressive interest rate hikes and diverging from them which is quite interesting because I don't know if you would have seen this 10, 15 years ago when Larry Summers was the most uh, important voice in Obama's ear, for example, on this front. But uh, here's what he had to say. For example, over the past year, we've seen dramatic decline in inflation that dropped by two thirds down to three percent at a time when unemployment has been below four percent for the longest stretch in 50 years. I've rejected the notion that the reason for inflation is the only way to get inflation down is reduce employment and or reduce wages. Remember, the experts said to get inflation under control, we need to lower those wages and drive up unemployment. But I've never bought that. I don't think the problem in America today is too many people working or working people are making too much money. Well, the, the problem, though, Mr. President, is that the uh, head of the Fed, who you kept on, Jerome Powell, from the Trump administration, does not agree with your assessment. Biden hasn't always felt that way. That's not a true statement there by him. 
However, the fact that he's saying that is a market improvement for the Democratic Party. There's no there's no other way to slice it. The problem is, is that in practice, that's not what's being implemented, because as much as Biden has like improved on the substance of understanding that the connection between labor and employment um, or I'm sorry, inflation and employment is not what like Milton Friedmanites uh, and these Fed or, uh, Orthodox thinkers have been pushing. Uh, essentially, he's un- come to the conclusion that that's a myth, which is true. Yeah, it's not but experts. Pr- it's Larry Summers. Right. But or, the, uh, not Larry Summers. It's um, uh, the, your Fed chairman, Jerome Powell. Right. Exactly. And that's that's the thing. That's the problem here is that. I'm I'm very encouraged to hear that. I I mean, this is what progressive economists have been saying for years and years and years. And yet you can't find anybody within the uh, like Fed leadership that doesn't in some way subscribe to that notion. So Biden is showing progress on this front. The problem, though, is that eventually these rate hikes where they were essentially at zero in the midst of the pandemic being raised 10 different times to over 5%, um, which is the highest that it's been since, what, 2007? And in terms of the unemployment numbers, there it's uh, the lowest since 1969. So again, the, thank you for looking that up, Bradley. Those metrics are very good for uh, like the, the president's resume, essentially. But the, the these the the effects of this are going to be felt. Uh, it's just a matter of when. And the problem is is that Biden, despite believing this, is still too committed to notions of bipartisanship that are immensely outdated. And that is superseding his evolution on that. And Jerome Powell should have been gone day one when Biden got into office, but. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Yeah, I mean, Harold Meyerson has a piece in um, uh, the American Prospect, but it's basically on like Biden's economy and how it's been good for people at the low end of the wage scale. They've experienced wage growth through like the tight labor market. But, and I think that's important to uh, note um, as people like try to say like there was just an uh, uh, um, it was just all negative. I think like it shows that the um, stimulus during the pandemic was good and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but the problem is. What if there's a recession, yeah. right? Like that, this stuff is fleeting. I'm, I'm glad we got back to normal before COVID, but guess what? Bernie Sanders uh, didn't uh, have success in the 2016 uh, uh, primary because of the COVID economy. It was because of the normal standard economy that we're celebrating our getting back to normal on. Yeah. And, and so like we, like, I'm glad that there's been a little bit of wage growth, but it, uh, to me, like I, the, the, the idea that it's, um, uh, enjoyable by anybody that's lower income like they have to look at rent prices or other things like that are actually still inflated despite the overall numbers going down like i think people uh, are really uh, out of touch <laughs> on, well on it's the same thing. usage of the metric of like gdp and yeah. that, that as if that has any effect on or it, its effects are felt in any way on a day-to-day basis by the average worker and um, so like i'd say the economy is really good for the rentiers that were in control of the economy before covid19 and it's been moderately uh okay uh for some of the working people but i don't know how uh, durable those gains are exactly exactly um durability is the key right if if these things are not put in place by fed policy or really something like that something like that they'll they'll change due to market forces right and 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 part of the problem here too is that senate brain The Senate brain that was embedded in Biden's decision to keep someone like Powell on is the same Senate brain that doesn't get rid of the filibuster, which is a huge reason why our fiscal policy is outsourced to the Fed when much of what we could do to combat inflation would be clawing back all that money that's being hoarded and not spent by the wealthiest in the country in this country because we've done tax break after tax break for the top 1.01 percent whatever uh, the case may be through offshore tax havens through loopholes they've gotten richer and richer and richer and that is a much bigger driver of inflation than anything in the labor market it's 
oligarchs hoarding wealth and not putting that money into circulation in a way that like makes the economy more robust. So because we have been unable to get rid of things like the filibuster because of Senate congeniality, that is what is the systemic driver of some of the dynamics that we're seeing right here. We should be having much more robust financial policy. The power of the purse is supposed to be through um, uh, through the legislative branch. And it is not that way anymore because of political corruption and because of institutionalism that should have been done away with a long time ago. Um, with that said, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Melissa Via Nicholas uh, on her book, Data Borders. <laughs> back and we are joined now by Melissa Via Nicholas, assistant professor in the graduate school of library and information studies at the University of Rhode Island, author of Data Borders, How Silicon Valley is Building an Industry Around Immigrants. Um, Melissa, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So uh, the term data borders, how do you define it and what are the best examples that our audience might recognize immediately like in our everyday lives? Well, I really define it by starting to think about our borderlands, specifically the U.S.-Mexico border, and what it feels like to live in a borderland. Um, and that's a really specific feeling. There's hybrid cultures and people sort of experiencing each other's culture, tension and friction. But then when we move to data borderlands, we really don't feel it, but we're always at the edge of it. So we're always at the edge of it through data and our digital entrances with technology. Um, people might be most familiar with uh, the company's Amazon, um, which Amazon holds um, a large amount of data for ICE, for the USCIS. Um, and this is how we sort of enter into data borders is through our consumption and our relationship with these companies that have huge contracts with ICE um, to hold immigrant data. So hopefully that sums it up, but yes. there's many, many companies that have those contracts with ICE. Um, Melissa, just quickly, your I think your mic's uh, against your hair or your shirt or okay. something. Just, there we go, it, th it. it happens all the time, don't worry <laughs> about it. Um, so uh, like some of these contracts, some of these companies that you mentioned, you mentioned Amazon, I know Palantir is infamous, obviously, give us, give the audience a sense of some of these like public private contracts with some of these Silicon Valley companies. Sure. So um, ICE might hold a contract with a company like Palantir, um, which do consumer and defense com um, contracts. Palantir will build databases for ICE, um, a database specifically called Gotham and other databases where they hold folks's data so that um, different um, law enforcement can access that data and find those folks. And most notoriously in the past, Palantir has built databases for um, policing, for predictive policing in cities like New Orleans and Chicago. But um, really what they're doing is they're building out of data, sort of data mining and how to data mine folks that they want to surveil more, such as immigrants. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because so many of the technologies you de you describe, I feel like we talked about them within the context of like the Black Lives Matter protests in particular mm -hmm. and um, just it, as examples of the police state. But you see how the police state is not just local policing. It's on this federal level and 
in an increasing manner, it's being deployed uh, as surveillance, um, whether through things like biometric data, retinal scanning, uh, you talk about, you know, even DNA, th mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to surveil migrants or people living here in kind of a, an inherently precarious um, position. Right. And my concern really is biodata because it's so valuable and there's such a fuzzy area with who owns that data. So immigrants often have to give many different types of biodata, um, their fingerprints, their face scan, um, their DNA samples. One of the most notorious examples recently is the CBP-1 app, um, which is being used for all refugees trying to get across the U.S.-Mexico border. And um, immigrant rights groups have voiced concern because that requires a face scan. But again, there's this opaque line of we don't know where that data goes, who has rights to it, and um, how much of the, the immigrants that are trying to come over the border have their rights to their own bi bio data. Certainly. I mean, I, I would I would think that there could be a uh, pretty strong case about these uh, th th these scans violating rights to privacy if they're deployed essentially as just surveillance in everyday life. I mean, what are some of the examples? I know you spoke to a lot of people about their experiences with the uh immigration police state and in connection with Silicon Valley, what, what, what were some of those stories that um, our audience might uh, be interested in? Yeah, I mean, I talked to a lot of people who came here undocumented and their surrounding family members. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting was that a lot of people are quite familiar with the technologies being used in the detention centers because they talk and they hear from each other. Um, so one thing that someone said was that they used heat scanning to scan body like anxiety to be able to sort of see um, how people are feeling which of course is quite normal with um, data and surveillance is surveilling feelings um, and a lot of people in that community were concerned that as they crossed through borders they were being sort of scanned like heat scanned um, there's a lot also examples just of DACA students um, who feel like they've given over a lot of data that they can't necessarily get back. It's just sort of in the government's hands now, um, all of the data of how they came here and who they're related to. So it kind of goes far and wide. And then, of course, when folks did cross over, they experience very intense forms of surveillance. Um, and it makes the the actual physical border at the U.S.-Mexico border more dangerous, sort of the more technology and more um, surveillance, the higher the stakes. So that whole crossing experience is even more dangerous. I mean, it, to even to say it's more dangerous, given the news of this week where the uh, whistleblower spoke out about the orders to throw children into the Rio Grande and these barrels uh, that are cutting people up and killing them because they're wrapped with barbed wire. I mean, those are the stories that I think get people, or at least people with consciences, mm -hmm. to um, to balk and to to have this emotional reaction. But the the constant anxiety of feeling like you're just a second away from being ripped away from your community and from your home that you came here to this country for whatever reason, to meet up with family, to flee a, flee a bad political situation. Um, that is the kind of generational trauma that I feel like we're gonna need to contend with as a society. Right. And then to link that to data, I mean, we have, unfortunately, I feel like Texas and Florida trying to one up each other with how they treat immigrants, but immigrants come here to build lives and to build better lives. So then as their data is stored and they aren't necessarily given specific data rights, those futures that they're trying to build might be hindered by that data. And that happens to a lot of folks, especially underrepresented folks in the US who are already citizens, like their data may or may not get their home loan approved or get them certain insurance. So 
the idea that immigrants are coming here for a future, for a different lives, and then they have their data already going out in front of them, deciding wh where they might or might not access is a concern to me as well. Absolutely. Um, when did this relationship between some of these Silicon Valley companies and ICE and DHS really start ramping up? You know, it's interesting. I think as data consumers, we see or experience like things that are actually happening 10 years ago. So um, they started to find that Palantir was doing predictive analytics and pr predictive crime analytics back in 2010, but really didn't find out about it until like 2015 or later. So we unfortunately find out way later what has been going on. But really, it feels like around 2010 and on, there was more of a growing relationship between the Department of Homeland Security and Silicon Valley and sort of a switch from relationships with Boeing and Lockheed Martin that are usually the ones who build defense to this pitch from the Department of Homeland Security to have this sort of Silicon Valley innovation around surveilling underrepresented populations, specifically immigrants. So I think through the 2010s and then with the Trump administration, we started to see bids for what they called this um, smart wall. And it was an alternative to a physical wall, which we remember Trump was the Trump which Mexico um, did not pay for, yes, right. yes. <laughs> and unfortunately, the digital wall is more of a, um, it's politically Democrats and Republicans support it, but there are dangers there because it's holding folks' data, it's locating folks, of course, through location, um, through their social media. So we see Department of Homeland Security sort of ask for different companies in Silicon Valley to pitch um, projects on hardware along the US border and um, AI and different databases to really surveil immigrants. And that was sort of through 2016 on and just kind of continues. Now we have a company called Anduril that had its beginnings in Oculus. Um, they're mm. purely defense now, but they generate ideas like drones and night goggle visions and it's sort of the same zeal of silicon valley building video games or um you know any kind of new technology but around surveillance of underrepresented people and and how when that data is collected can you talk about how that gets deployed on the local level essentially sold to some of these local law enforcement agencies and um, basically making it incredibly profitable for these companies because they're <laughs> they're they are creating a profit for themselves with ostensibly like federal surveillance efforts but it's just because you know of of the the private contracting element yeah, and that's one of the problems is that data of immigrants becomes a product and it becomes more and more valuable um, between these companies and ICE. Um, one example is just social media data. In the past couple of years, deportation started to happen really specifically where people, ICE would show up um, in really specific places that they couldn't have known about without a sort of location services and triangulating social media. So they were definitely tracking um, people through their social media. Um, we also have companies like LexisNexis, which I'm concerned about and librarians specifically are concerned about and, and lawyers and all kinds of folks who depend on LexisNexis because they hold contracts with ICE too. Um, and so they hold the data and also give ICE access to what you would assume is private data um, through their data banks to surveil folks. So that's become an increasing problem for folks like librarians or lawyers who have a conflict of interest if they have immigrant patrons or clients and need to use LexisNexis, but LexisNexis actually holds contracts with ICE. Um, there's no ethical way around that with working with the public as librarians specifically. I, I 
what does their contract entail? Um, uh, it's to access people's data. So it LexisNexis for anyone who has a driver's license and feels secure about looking for your own data. Everyone has a right to see their data ID in LexisNexis. So you can go up to Le LexisNexis and search for how to get your data ID. LexisNexis essentially holds data of a lot of the population. I searched for my own um, data ID and got about 70 pages about myself that they had been gathering. <laughs> so I can guarantee your listeners, if they feel comfortable doing that, we'll also get a large packet because our data is quite valuable in large amounts and um, LexisNexis buys and sells that data. So for something like LexisNexis, who gathers a lot of data and who had traditionally been a database builder for us folks with library backgrounds, you know, we teach databases, we teach students how to search databases for their patrons. They also give ICE um, access to people's private data. And that's the problem here um, for many of us is that our data is lending itself into these large networks um, that are also contracted with ICE. I, it uh, I'm I'm sticking on this because it's just so shocking to hear about. But like, what does this? How is it possible that there's 70 pages on you? I mean, what what information could um, could that could possibly be in there? Like, just generally for other people if they want to look this stuff up. Yeah, it was all of my previous addresses, probably like every email I've ever had, um, a lot of personal information. I feel like. I'm a citizen with privilege. And so they have all of this and I never gave them the, the authority to, to gather it, but they just can and do. But for folks who are, don't have rights to citizenship, it's so much more vulnerable to be able to access everywhere that they've gone. So LexisNexis, like a lot of these big data um, companies, they buy and sell that information from other companies and LexisNexis specifically, um, and also Elsevier, the publisher Elsevier, they have a net worth as big as Google. Um, and that's really from data purchasing and selling. So there's a conflict here because then they have access to anyone's data and they can give ICE access to anyone's data. It also becomes difficult because these companies like LexisNexis, Palantir, Anderol, um, they're private companies. So they won't give the public access to the behind the scenes of these databases or infrastructure um, because it's their own private like databases Ford. that they've built. Yes. Yeah, so they that's... The real difficulty in the public finding out how our data moves together um, for purposes of surveillance of immigrants. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is amazing how ubiquitous this stuff is, and things like you know, I this is such a a, a specific problem, but you know, in my old job, I had to travel a lot, and I had a. Uh, TSA pre-check, right? But like now everyone has that. And so it doesn't give you much of an advantage, but the clear uh, mm -hmm. aisle is the one that you're supposed to sign up for. And that's hundreds of dollars, but that's just another private company collecting your retinal data. Right. And I don't want to do that, th that, but th there seems to be, even in the reckoning of like what we all Cho uh, uh, I guess reckoned with in the in the NSA uh, documents that were leaked by Snowden and our kind of um, m broader understanding about what the surveillance state really meant in a post 9/11 world. There's the 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 privatization element as you as you write about has just ramped up and it's particularly mm -hmm. being used um, at the border and and for these for migrants within the country in the most problematic ways imaginable. Right. And it's a difficult trade-off. Like we always find ourselves trading off, like you said, like, am I getting in my face scan so I can get to the front of TSA and get, yes. or get through customs faster? And that's what folks at the border are also experiencing with the new CBP one app, which if they can even get through the app, the app errors so often, um, which is how much data am I going to give over and ha where is that going to follow me once I get in through refugee status? Um, and so that's the concern is how much of our rights are we, getting, are we giving over and how much rights do immigrants have to their own private 
bio data specifically, because that that is so valuable. Um, you know, a lot of DNA held together is quite valuable. Um, I also think about like we hear quite often the writer strike and the actor strike. They have their own concerns with AI and having their image reproduced. So I feel like we can see folks that we kind of think are like at the top or have these really great positions and they're fighting for their own private privacy rights to data. So we can imagine, and what I'm concerned with is how undocumented people have the right to their own data as well. Well, it's a, I mean, <laughs> they, they are stripped of every other right seemingly uh, yeah. to exist in this country. So it's, it's uh, very, very dark, but fascinating stuff. Um, Ma Melissa Via Nicholas, assistant professor in the graduate school of library and information studies at the university of Rhode Island. The book is Data Borders, How Silicon Valley is Building an Industry Around Immigrants. Uh, Melissa will put a link to your book wherever people are listening to this um, or watching and at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. All right, guys, quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about Finland with uh, Kyle Bailey. <laughs> back and we are joined now by kyle bailey from helsinki well he's he's in helsinki now a phd candidate at the depart in the department of politics at york university toronto uh kyle thank you so much for for coming on today uh it's fantastic to be here emma so i gotta say you know i am i am finnish um i have family still in finland in uh in kind of like the southwest area uh you know pori and uh I'm not sure if you know uh, Sikainen, but like I went there and visited there when I was 13. But there were a few other cities where my family is, but I don't remember. Um, anyway, it's 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 beautiful, and I would love to go back at some point because I still have like cousins and, and stuff in Finland. But um, yeah, it, not a not a great time right now for Finland in terms of <laughs> the election results. Um, man, like f for our audience, so. Last, I would imagine a lot of people heard about leadership in Finland was Prime Minister Sanna Marin and her, um, you know, videos of her dancing with her friends, which was so outrageous. But her center left party has lost um, and came in third in April in the elections. And that's given rise to a right wing government in Finland. Um, how did that happen? How did she get ousted despite like the left within the context of fin Finnish politics being incredibly strong historically? Well, I mean, I mean, there, there's kind of like a, a, a wider backdrop to this, you know, it seems almost banal to say it at this point, but what we've been living through for the past decade or more is, is basically a multi-dimensional crisis of neoliberal global capitalism. So, so in the years from the 2008 global financial crisis until the global uh, COVID pandemic, we've seen all kinds of morbid symptoms of this crisis. We've seen growing economic inequality and social uh, exclusion. And you know, that's been exacerbated by a decade of austerity uh, including, to some extent, in the Nordic countries. We've seen the rise of uh, populist leaders who are openly disdainful of globalization and the growing centrality uh, of the climate uh, emergency. And, you know, one, one of the biggest trends in, in this crisis has been the, the waning of the so-called neoliberal center, 
the, the centrist political parties in Europe and elsewhere. So whereas uh, at the core of this kind of neoliberal project during the 1990s and 2000s, which was really epitomized by uh, um, Clintonism in the United States and third way social democracy in Britain and Europe, uh, at the core of this was really trying to lock in and kind of constitutionalize neoliberal reforms in all these different countries. But since uh, 2008, uh, that, that kind of politics has been waning a lot, uh, so much so uh, actually that now the, these uh, centrist parties are finding it harder and harder to square the requirements of capital accumulation globally with the interests of the populations whose votes uh, they need uh, to stay in power. And, you know, unfortunately, the, the fledgling uh, kind of socialist left that we've seen grow up hasn't been the main political beneficiary of this waning uh, neoliberal center. Mm. It's, it's been the far right, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what we're seeing today. That's like the wider context for things, things in Finland as well. You have this kind of dialectical double act. Uh, like a, a double act between this uh, declining neoliberal center and a rising far right. And we're seeing in, in all the different countries of Europe and further afield, all, all the different possible combinations that that kind of double act uh, can take. So the election results, right? The National Coalition Party came in first, then the Finns Party, which is the far right very scary party, and we'll talk talk about them in a second. And then Mar uh, Marin's Social Democratic Party finished in third. Now, just take us through that election in April, how that shook out, and then eventually the coalition formed by those top two parties, the center-right party and then the far-right party. Well, I mean, there, there was uh, a coalition talks that seemed at sometimes quite fraught, but you, you saw a meeting of minds. And, and really what we've ended up with, uh, with this government, is, is ba it's basically a coalition of uh, a neoliberal uh, centrist party, the National Coalition Party, uh, and, and the far right. So basically a, go a coalition of far right racists and their neoliberal enablers. So, I mean, in, in the government coalition talks, the, the true Finns, which are a far right uh, party, they, they spent most of their time trying to get uh, anti-immigration reforms in included in the government program. So these are things like higher income caps uh, for co foreign workers, uh, stricter guidelines in order to acquire Finnish uh, citizenship. And they, they wanted to like reduce drastically the number of refugees uh, Finland takes. And you know, uh, several Finns ministers have made absolutely no secret of their overt hostility uh, towards immigrants. Like you said, this is a quite scary uh, party in many ways. So they're overtly hostile to especially black and brown immigrants. Uh, they, they've got far right affiliations and, and also pro-fascist and, and pro-Nazi sympathies. So to give you uh, a, a couple of examples, uh, the Minister of Economic Economic Affairs, uh, Wilhelm Unila, he narrowly just recently survived a, a vote of no confidence, and but then he was forced to resign soon after, after it was revealed, among other things, that he'd been uh, a speaker at a rally organized uh, by basically violent Nazi uh, thugs, like a veritable who's who of neo-Nazis in Finland, like including the now banned uh, Nordic resistance movement. So, I mean, that, that's just one and example. And he said he made multiple jokes about Heil Hitler, like, I mean, multiple jokes about that. I mean, and he was also, I think... Uh, what I read was that he made a co comments as well about promoting, quote, climate abortion in Africa, meaning saying that we should give abortions to Africans to combat climate change. So we've talked about ecofascism within the context of it, like kind of catching up in the United States. Some of the rhetoric, it's it's just much more robust right now in Europe. But I'm, we're going to see an importation of it, I'd imagine, like really scary stuff uh, uh, for one of the top. Uh, ministries uh, in Finland.
to have be, be led by that guy at least you know before he was forced to resign oh yeah certainly and you know everything's always a joke uh with the Finns party and of course it's not a joke Let, let's uh, go through a couple of other uh Finns ministers so you'll see uh Hala Aho uh, the former Finns party leader and now the speaker of the parliament this guy is a militant an unapologetic racist. This is someone who thinks that Islam is a religion of pedophiles. Uh, this is someone who said uh, that Somalis have a genetic trait uh, to rob and steal from people. This is someone who's even said things like that he thinks, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if pro-immigration uh, female MPs were raped uh, by foreigners? So, I mean, I mean, you know, this is the kind of and stuff. He's the, and he's the speaker of parliament now, right? Because and he's a part of this Finns party, right? This is the party that came in second for people still following the far right party and a part of this coalition. Yes, he's the former leader and he, he's uh, an ideologically influ influential person in this parliament, uh, in this uh, party. And he's now the speaker of the parliament. Yes. And and the current Finns party leader, uh, Rika Pura, is, is now the finance minister. And she's also uh, in the past made a whole host of uh, racist and even violent uh, comments uh, against immigrants, including on Halo Aho's blog. So, I mean, th this is one, at least one half of the story uh, with this, uh, with this uh, government, you know, uh, far right racism. <laughs> so this, yeah, they now hold how many uh, ministry seats, the Finns party? Well, they're, they're the junior partner in, in the coalition. And, and this brings me uh, to the, the, the other side of the story, not just far right racists, but their, their neoliberal uh, enablers. So, so the party which formed the coalition is Petri Orpo's uh, National Coalition Party. And th this is a party that's championing, uh, committed to an extreme uh, neoliberal austerity uh, program. So this includes, uh, for example, what's in the government program uh, right now includes like 6 billion uh, euros worth of cuts over the next parliament to health, education and welfare, including cuts to uh, unemployment benefit, uh, to housing benefit and to social assistance. And I, I, I mean, that that's one side of it, cuts. But the, the, this uh, government program also includes a number of direct attacks on, on the Finnish labor movement. So, for example, the, these range from a, a very unpopular measure to make the, the first day of sick leave uh, that workers take unpaid uh, to things like uh, restrictions and fines for workers who engage in sympathy strikes and who engage in uh, wildcat strikes, things like this. It, it's a very extreme uh, program in many ways. And so it's just the uh, worst marriage uh, possible. You have Nazis and uh, anti-worker pro-austerity uh, measures working together um, as a part of the, the this new government. And, and I guess that does bring me to the party that came in third, the Social Democrats. Um, what is your... Uh, take on where they drop the ball here in advocating for th their party to continue to hold power. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you you can kind of see when when we're looking even now at reactions uh, to this kind of new government, which has uh, on the one hand dragged the Finns party away from its more kind of welfare nationalist economic policies towards uh, an austerity program that can be expected to hurt their own voters in the end. And, and the National Coalition Party in turn being dragged uh, towards some far right uh, social policies. I mean, if, if we look at the broad reactions to this, uh, like on the broad left, we, we, we can see both some like prospects and, and pitfalls going forward. So to address your question, I mean, a lot of the, the like liberal and center left um, responses to the government, uh, they, they've focused a lot on like the damage uh, that racist ministers 
uh, are doing to Finland's international reputation and kind of like progressive uh, veneer. But you know, in 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 some ways, they don't go very uh, deep. Like on 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 the one hand, they don't necessarily uh, even address uh, you know the government program and like especially the austerity parts. Uh, in 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 addition to the to the racism so i mean i mean that's one thing uh the the social democrats have tended uh for the for the last decades to have kind of in their own way embraced uh neoliberal economic reforms as well and we, we've had governments in finland that also include center right parties uh, as well that have kind of been part of this uh neoliberal consensus in finland which, which has been more like moderate than in some other places like Britain or, or the United States, but has n nevertheless been uh, very real. Uh, so I mean that that that's one thing. But then then there's also uh, some questions uh, ab ab about like the the even the the further left uh, groupings. And I, I I don't know what kind of questions you you want to ask, but maybe maybe we could also consider some of the, the, the actual left-wing responses as well. Sure, I, I, go ahead if you don't mind expanding. Uh, yeah, so for, for example, there, there's a, like at least some good prospects for like challenging this government. Like we, we've seen some quite uh, good early small-scale protests outside of the, the Finnish parliament, which is promising in, in terms of building a wider movement to challenge this, especially if the left can kind of join up the, the different fragments of all the groups that are interested in uh, protesting this new government, which is quite broadly unpopular. Uh, I mean, that's one thing. Another thing is that the, the assaults on the labor movement also open up the possibility uh, that the trade unions will take action. And for example, it's not impossible to imagine at least a one day general strike uh, in the future. And it, it, it has some precedent in, in, in Finland. So, I mean, that's that's something. But I, I mean, th there are also a lot of issues that even on, on, on the left, we, we sometimes struggle with uh, as well. So like, for example, when we're talking about the, the causes of far right racism and, you know, what's actually driving it, uh, sometimes we talk about austerity on the left, but we, we don't necessarily go, go deeper to talk about the, the forces of capitalism and globalization. The, that are also driving uh, the working class into misery and also now driving a, a significant portion of the middle class uh, into misery as well and creating a base uh, all around Europe and in North America and elsewhere for these kind of far right uh, racist parties. So, I mean, like, let, let's take one example. Uh, like the, the European left in, in general has has historically and now and especially since brexit uh it's it's had more and more trouble separating kind of the wheat from the chaff when it comes to thinking about the european union so for example uh, most people on, on the european left tend to point to things in the eu like its defense of international human rights standards and things like the the free uh, movement of labor but if we really look at the EU, that's not really the core uh, of the project. Like the core institutions are the European single market and the common currency, the Eurozone. And, and what these have kind of represented in, in relation to all these neoliberal governments uh, we've had in Europe uh, is, is a thoroughly like anti-democratic project of locking in uh, neoliberal reforms in, in the interests of capital and big business. So, I mean, uh, one, one thing going forward uh, that the left really needs to do in order to get at these deep structural causes is, is separate out the, the aspects of the European Union that support capital free trade and and globalization and those uh and those which uh, support workers because you know the free movement of workers in the eu which was so important uh in the brexit referendum i mean surely that's an end in itself and something that's important 
in itself and not just as a complement to the free movement of capital. So what we need to do on the left is, is, is oppose the international mobility of capital while supporting uh, the mobility of labor and the institutionalization of workers' rights and, and power. So, I mean, that, that's a kind of fawny uh, issue for no, the left as points. well going forward. Uh, great points. I, I would imagine, though, that um, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic because Finland is such a small nation that um, the resistance to those kinds of forces uh, once these like neoliberal interests get a foot in the door must be quite difficult given like the uh, the power of the capital on the other side. And I guess that brings me to just my next question about the threat that this new coalition um, with the uh, that is much more sympathetic to those forces. Um, what is the threat to the lauded and uh, honestly robust by particularly American standards uh, modes of social safety within Finland in terms of like, you know, having one of the best education systems in the world, um, having uh, the uh, having labor laws that are so much more tilted towards workers that they have engaged in something like a general strike <laughs> before, which is something so foreign to us in the American context. Like, if you could just give us a sense of some of the social programs, how successful they've been in Finland, and how they might be under threat with this new government. Uh, well, I mean, fi Finland over the course of the 20th century, uh, following in, in some ways uh, the example of Sweden, but also setting in, in others its own uh, course, uh, built up a, a comprehensive and, and quite uh, surprisingly, even by European standards, universalist uh, welfare state that was really based on a, a kind of the, the idea was a, a class compromise between uh, capitalists and workers, but also rooted and, and backed up by significant power uh, on the part of, of labor. But I mean, especially since the from the 1970s and 80s and through to the, the recession uh, in the 1990s in Finland, these things have been slowly uh, eroded and chipped away at. And so, for example, Finland's had one of the, the fastest rising rates of inequality in Europe. Uh, and it's the fastest rising because uh, it started it starts from a relatively low level. Right. But the, the direction of travel uh, is still quite clear because, you know, after the, the crisis of the 1970s, that capitalist crisis, uh, employers everywhere, they, they, they walked out on this idea uh, of, of a comprehensive welfare state that would balance between the interests of capitalists and workers. And I, I mean, since then, we've seen uh, especially like uh, social democratic parties in, in Finland and elsewhere, but also center-right, kind of slowly chipping away at these gains from uh, gains of workers. Because, you know, really, that's what neoliberalism is anywhere. It's like capitalism without significant uh, resistance from workers. And, and you, you know, the, these latest, this latest round of, of quite extreme austerity in the government program is going to hit uh, quite hard, potentially, if they manage to get all the legislation through because the, the, the parliament's uh, uh, just about to open. So, but, you know, it can be quite extreme and the cuts to unemployment benefit and, uh, and social assistance, which is like a last uh, resort uh, benefit for, for people who, who really need income. Uh, to get by, like cuts to these kind of things are going to really hurt, including people who voted for the Finns party. And I mean, it's one of these great ironies that these far right, uh, quote unquote, populist uh, parties claim to represent the interests of an excluded working class. Uh, I mean, just like Trump did as, as well in the yeah. United States. But then they, they actually end up uh, screwing them over and and you know they're not really offering any kind of real challenge uh, to the power of uh, employers and the establishment like they claim 
How does uh, what's happening in Finland, and uh, I'm not sure if you can speak on this, it's fine if not, um, connect to the, f the, the right word shift in Sweden as well? Um, there's a border that's shared, obviously, something like 5%, if I'm not mistaken, of, of Finns are Swedish speakers um, natively. Uh, it, I might be off on that, that, that percentage, you can correct me, Kyle, but... Um, like, what is the connection there? Are are those movements in any way analogous? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know exactly about the networks which link, say, the far right in Sweden and Finland. I mean, what, what I maybe could tentatively say is that uh, uh, Sweden has uh, historically, as part of its immigration policy, taken in more uh, migrants uh, than Finland, for example, it has a, a large uh, Kurdish uh, community mm. in Sweden. For example, that was a factor in the negotiations around Finland and Sweden joining or NATO. Because, yeah. yeah, Erdogan, uh, Turkey's uh, authoritarian uh, leader, uh, actually had a real problem with uh, Sweden taking uh, Kurdish uh, migrants who, who had been standing up against Turkey's historic uh, oppression of, of Kurds in, in the Middle East. But uh, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly. Emma. Sure, I, that was uh, completely out of left field, so don't, don't even worry about it. But um, th that, I guess, is where I'd love to, to take our conversation before we wrap um, about Finland's um, entry into NATO and how that connects really with um, the politics of, of the far right rising and, and if there is a connection, how bipartisan the desire is within Finland to join NATO and what that means, I guess, about neoliberalism and austerity within Finland. Well, I mean, I mean, ju just taking like NATO, I, I mean, it's uh, it's part of a whole uh, complex of institutions that have actually come to play a, a large role in in, in neoliberalism uh, writ large, because it, it's not just about economics, like, uh, you know, uh, weaponry and wars uh, also back up uh, capitalist uh, interests. And, and NATO's played quite a, a, a vicious role in supporting American power, especially, and American wars in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan and in other places like this. Uh, what, where it gets complicated is that uh, Finland uh, obviously has a very, very long border and a very long history with Russia. So when Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, people in Finland, they, they identified very directly with Ukrainian suffering. And th there were all these kind of analogies to like Finland's uh, uh, conflicts with Russia in the Second World War, especially the, the so-called Winter War, mm. you know. So, I mean, I think what we've seen, at, le at least from my perspective, is that we've seen that pro-Ukrainian sentiment really channeled uh, somewhere where it needn't have gone actually, which is into pro-NATO sentiment. Like the problem is really seen uh, not as one of militarism and violence more generally and of military alliances uh, making the world uh, a less safe place. The problem is seen as one of Russian imperialism and NATO is the answer to make Finland uh, more safe. And, th and that's been the majority perspective in Finland, uh, uh, basically amongst all the, the main political parties. And uh, You can understand it though, right? I mean, I guess it is an easy sell in terms of just like the history of past Russian in invasions of Finland. It, it, like domestically, I would imagine that, that that's, that's not going to meet much resistance. Yeah, and, and you know, Ukraine needed to wage a war of self-defense against Russia, uh, yes. who, who invaded it. So that had to be done. But where it gets complicated, of course, is that you're, you're kind of inviting in American power and American imperialism to try and, and balance uh, against Russia. And here's where it gets uh, complicated, because the, the American interest, even though they keep saying it's to help Ukraine 
win a quick war against Russia. I mean, it, it, it's not it, it's not quite like that. I, I mean, sometimes I call it kind of like a, a, a Goldilocks war in in some ways. And what I mean by that is that the the Americans they they want to intervene uh, to prop up Ukraine just enough. So that the Ukrainians don't sign uh, what what they the Americans would regard, especially as a capitulationist settlement along the lines of Minsk uh, or Minsk uh, too, right? So they they want to prop them up enough to avoid that, but not so much as, as to inadvertently end up dragging the United States, especially because when we're we're talking about NATO. We're really talking about the Americans because they they account for seventy percent of all dis- defense spending, uh, you know, war spending across all NATO members. So I mean, the, the Americans don't want to prop up Ukraine so much that they would get dragged into a direct war with Russia, either. Right. Well, I mean. That that is the the uh, I would say the balance being struck here. Um, I, it it we we had an interview on Monday about this as well, um, which was met like I think f- with some mixed reactions from people um, about the about NATO in general and about the United States' uh, involvement in Ukraine. I support fun- I support uh, funding uh, the Ukrainian defense, but it, you can still have two. Uh, tracks uh, of of thought at the same time, which is that NATO, though, is a clearly, clearly an extension of U.S. interests within Europe. And then for Sweden and Finland to join into the alliance within, what, like a year and a half of the invasion, um, that that is clearly, I would say, a win for U.S. Uh, <laughs> capitalist interests and uh, international kind of empire interests within the context of Europe. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with that. And unfortunately, it's always the same with militarism on wars. I mean, you have hawks on you know, our side, and then you have hawks uh, on the other sides, in this case, on the Russian side. And, and you know, it's it's another one of these double acts, because they, they feed off and encourage one another. And I mean, what's what gets lost and crowded out in all this is, is the possibility of ceasefires, negotiations, uh, and e- even a fragile peace. Because while it's true that Ukraine needed to defend itself against Russia, uh, at least enough to be able to negotiate from a position of strength. I mean, what it doesn't need is is to wage an ongoing war against Russia that's going to be frozen and and potentially last for years. And and I mean, if nothing's done, uh, potentially even like a a lost decade or something like this. And this is something that uh, NATO does uh, impose a constraint uh, in in terms of because they're they're uh, not really interested in negotiations. What what they're interested in is one, weakening Russia, which is something completely different from helping Ukraine potentially at least. Uh, they want uh, to overcome contradictions within NATO, especially uh, that France and Germany would play a more independent uh, role vis-a-vis the United States in NATO. And, and you know, I think in some ways they're, they're also looking towards uh, the bigger picture, uh, not just in Europe, but also in the Pacific, because America's looking at China and it's very yeah. interested in containing China and, you know, in some ways bogging down Russia in, in a long, long war uh, with Ukraine, kind of, uh, you you can kind of see how that kind of contributes to making space for America to continue this uh, strained but nevertheless real pivot to Asia, which started uh, under Obama. Yeah, I mean, well, I, that that uh, that is a consequence, um, but but fascinating stuff, Kyle Bailey, and also dark stuff particularly about domestically what's happening in Finland. I really yeah. appreciate you catching our audience up with that. Um, PhD candidate at in the Department of Politics at York University in Toronto. Kyle, where can uh, people find your stuff if, they, if they'd like to read more of what you have to say? 
Well, I, I have a recent article in in the uh, in this year's Socialist Register, uh, which is published by Merlin Press uh, in London, by Monthly Review in New York, and by Fernwood Press in in Toronto. So, uh, in the Socialist Register 2023. All right. Well, really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Kyle. All right. Thank you, Emma. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. All right, guys. Well, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program. But first, we have to tell you, this is the first day of the Just Coffee 25% off sale. You can get the majority report blend. You can get any coffee, right, Bradley? Any coffee with the code MR25. Even the Marin stuff? Eaten well. Maybe I mean, there's a carb out Steer that. clear of that crap. Oh, no. um, just kidding. Just kidding. It's all good. It's all good. Me are, uh, me are, me are, MR25. MR25. My brain is not good anymore. Um, that is the code Just Coffee 25% off with the code MR25. Um, JustCoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee, tea, and chocolate. Code MR25 for 25% off of their coffee. Matt, what is happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, yeah, uh, Left Reckoning, like I said, uh, Griscom's going to be doing a, a bit of a memorial, a Michael Brooks memorial uh, Griscom sh- stream today. Um, for Patreons at patreon.com slash Left Reckoning, we're going to be finishing up our reading of Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon about the 1848 revolution and uh, why it didn't really uh, do the full thing and ended <laughs> up with a... Uh, a sort of restoration of the monarchy under uh, Napoleon's nephew. So uh, check that out, patreon.com slash left reckoning. Um, not excited about that Ridley Scott Napoleon uh, movie. Gotta say, I have low expectations. Uh, I see, like, I, I'm very, um, I, I don't know about, like, Ridley Scott. I don't even know, I, I barely know about Christopher Nolan, just enough to be skeptical of the Oppenheimer thing. But, like, I generally i like period pieces but i'm also like skeptical of like okay this is going to be neutered and even like um what was the uh the the black messiah movie the fred hampton movie yeah uh, yeah judas and the black like I, I think like all these are really good and then it's like you, you you sort of read the people who are like closer to the actual history of it and it's like okay well I guess it's better than another uh, Marvel Universe movie. Well, like, for example, you it, people might be objecting to, like, the fact that the Lakeith Stanfield character is portrayed semi-sympathetically when he was, you know, working with the FBI. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, but still, overall, I think pretty pretty good uh, compared to... And it has Dominique Fishback in it, who is, like, one of the best actresses around right now. I tried to watch that movie, uh, or that show, Swarm. It's too nasty. Um, but with regards to screenish. like Napoleon, like I mean, I like Hollywood uh, putting a large budgets towards period pieces. So totally. like, I, it, whether the politics are uh, agreeable or not, I'm uh, yeah, I think that'll be uh, lo- something to look forward to. I'm seeing Oppenheimer on Saturday with family, and um, I'm a little nervous about the politics. Got to say, we'll see if they. I hope they do Red Scare, com- you know, like the communist stuff. But. Yeah, it's a pretty important part of the story. I read. Uh, uh, American Prometheus, actually, the first month. Uh, That's what it's to based it. on, right? Yeah, yeah, by, um, I forget what the guy's name is. Um, but uh, I, I listened to that audio book the first month I... Uh, Kai Bird I was... and Martin, Marty Sherwin. Who we've actually had on the show, I believe. Wait, that's the author? Yeah, it seems, right? American Prometheus? Is this the book we're talking about? Yeah, maybe. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Right. Um, I didn't know those two authors. But anyway, that's a really good uh, uh, book. But I, yeah, I, I listened to it on audiobook the first month I worked at Majority Report. Oh, well, um, we'll see. And then I'm seeing Barbie on Monday. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm supporting this good weekend in cinema. Attack okay? on Men, sure. Yeah, well, Excuse me. Yeah, right. Well, I'm a part of the communist propaganda or yeah. the Chinese trying to government. emasculate people and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, That's yeah. what Barbie does. It's no, actually feminist. Yeah. What's interesting though is I, I'm kind of I'm kind of excited just because I think it's gonna just be a total like chaotic movie, Napoleon. Because like the last duel was also kind of chaotic with Ridley Scott. Um, but it's interesting that they chose Joaquin Phoenix because like Joaquin Phoenix, I think like historically is like. 25 years older than when Napoleon was like coming up and like, yeah. like, and, like the time they're doing period. that with Killers of the Flower yeah, Moon it's too like, right, I mean, it's like it's just kind of weird that obviously they're using a more marketable actor but like he's not like Joaquin's like 50 and the, Napoleon film like, has always been so bad at that like yes. and, and especially like showing war it's like fucking old fogies like John Wayne like no yeah. it is kids yeah <laughs> I mean that uh, the, uh, that's the the Game of Thrones books were good at that, like in terms of I mean it's fantasy, but it's depicting you know, Sansa's supposed to be like eleven getting married. Um, 
Anyway, Brand is like eight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I am excited for for Oppenheimer and Barbie. I'm seeing them both, and we'll report back. Um, uh, hey guys, same. Um, I will just say on ESPN we spoke about uh, the running back debacle at the tag deadline. What that means for like their uh, the the their labor politics essentially. We also talked about the passing of the torch at Wimbledon and. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins getting signed, all kinds of fun stuff, youtube.com slash ESPN show. What is up, my friends, Matt Binder and Brandon? Hello. Nothing much. Hello. Uh, what's happening on the discourse, Brandon? We should have a new episode for you out this weekend, <laughs> as I always say. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, an aspir- I'm an aspirational person. I hate, the, you know, I'm sure on the outside it looks like i say that a lot and that i don't deliver and that's just the truth uh but what you don't see is behind the scenes how hard i try to deliver but that's okay that's okay uh, and what a, your intent is it's a part of your charm um Matt Binder, <laughs> on the other side of things uh what's happening with your, your highly productive multiple shows that you're working on Feel right. bad, so, uh, yeah, sure. Feel so bad. this week for for doomed i used the opportunity that i had to uh actually do like a multi-stream with the letter hack where we talked about uh you know uh current events politics news me a lot of talk about me um we also uh you know talked about um uh michael brooks's book against the web a bit um so everyone should definitely go check that out at youtube.com slash matt binder a new episode of scam economy has been recorded it will be released early next week i uh, what you have to look forward to is a conversation with um, Paris Marx of the Great Tech Won't Save Us podcast, mm. where we dive into, um, we focus on, I should say, the one of the many uh, tech hype bubbles, and that is VR. And of course, we get a little bit into the metaverse and the cryptocurrencies fingers and that as well. So be on the lookout for that. It'll be up at youtube.com slash Matt Binder and at scameconomy.com. And um, I'm on the majority report right now. And then later tonight, Leftist Mafia. Boom. All right. Well, the number is 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. well, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back. I just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males.